Hey guys, today we're gonna to review a couple of lenses by Irix, the new Cine lenses, the 11 and the 150. Are they worth it? So a little bit about me, my name is Tim. I'm with a company called Liquid Arts Media and we make all sorts of cool stuff. I've been a cinematographer for about 19 or 20 years. I'm old and worked on all sorts of cool things from network television shows to national documentaries, feature films, branded content, everything in between. I've even consulted for Warner Brothers on some neat little stuff. So that's cool. <laughs> and over the years, I've gotten a chance to work on several different cameras and lenses and combinations. And I figured it was time that I give a review that wasn't so like scientific and nerdy because you can read all that. Uh, today we are going to review, review, eh, kind of talk about the Irix 11 Cine lens and the Irix 150 macro Cine lens. Anytime that a, a competitor kind of comes into the market and tries to shake things up, I get really excited about that, especially when it comes to cinema lenses. When I saw that Irix, really well known for their photography lenses, um, was gonna come out with Cine lenses, it piqued my interest. So they were getting into the hands of some cinematographers and influencers that could, could give them reviews. Um, and they sent me an 11 and a 150 before you could actually get hands on the ones that you bought. So thank you, Irix, for sending those. Very, very cool. I will note, this is not a paid sponsorship. Uh, we do not own the glass. They sent them to us to demo. This is a completely unbiased review. Uh, so this is my opinion. We're going to jump into some lenses and see what we think. Let's go. The very first thing up is the, uh, we're going to talk about the Irix, the 11 mil uh, ultra wide angle. It's, um, it's pretty small as you can see. I like its compact nature. I like the size of it. The build quality is, is really nice. It feels like I'm holding cinema glass. So that's definitely a check, uh, in that, in that regard, all of the rotation on the barrels, extremely smooth on the iris, extremely smooth on the focus. They're notched for industry standard follow focus. That's a great little ad and notched on the iris for focus motors, other pulling focus, any of that kind of nonsense. So really great build to the lens. Here's where it starts to kind of fall apart uh, for me, just, just visually looking at, at the lens itself. I, I like my glass to face face down. This, this can't, um, you have the, the rounded lens cap. Eh, that design on a lens where your, your most of your weight is here. Um, I don't like it facing up. I like my glass to face down. Very similar to, take this old Bessie here, the 70 to 200, um, face down when it's on a camera cart, when it's in, uh, on a shelf, anywhere like this, this is, this is how every other lens that I've dealt with faces. This is what I'm used to, but it also makes sense from the phys physical build. All the weight is down here and it's holding itself. It's, it's weakest point is facing up. Um, we requested these in, in PL. Uh, we use a bunch of different cameras where, whether it's Mavo, Alexa, Reds, um, FS7s, and primarily universally, we try to keep all of our lenses um, at PL mount. Right, right away on the cap, um, it's kind of like this suction cup kind of, kind of cap thing. Uh, I, I don't, I don't love that. I like it. I like it to lock this. This is going to be a love or hate thing. I think with most people, uh, having, having a secure lens hood, it does fit on there securely. It's just based on, on compression. There's no, there's no type of foam or anything in there, but I have a feeling like over time with this repetitive use of on and off, I could see the inside plastic getting either warped. Um, if it's put on wrong, it could kind of break. Um, but I think over time, this is going to kind of wear out EF lenses that have that rotating feels good, satisfying lock. I know it's in there. Um, have another PL version right here that twists is in there and locks, uh, E mounts are the same way. Micro four thirds to have this be the one that's different. Um, that that's weird to me. Um, looking at the glass itself, that's a large profile. That's cool. Um, then the lens cap, the lens cap is it's, it's the pinch design. It's super finicky. You know, you're supposed to grab right here that would release it and you pull away for protection. You have to protect that front element. It is the single most important feature of a lens and this can come off. 
like that. That's the that's the uh, that's the most important part of your lens, and I'm talking with very minimal effort. It just kind of pops right off, and then finding it when you're trying to put it back on, you're trying to find it. Oh, I cringe because I, I keep feeling myself like touching the glass um, over and over again. So it's it's really vulnerable in this state, with especially with a raised uh, element like that. Um, for trying to find it around and get it in and then this the secure lens. I, I don't I don't like it They need to they need to revisit this. I know they, these are already on the market um, But again, it's it's just Super super finicky to pull off then they talked about this magnetic hood when I read about this when I saw it I thought this was a, a pretty ingenious idea because we've all kind of flailed around with hoods um, I think the magnets need to be stronger. I don't think I like this design either. I really prefer the locking hoods because I know it's in place. This this doesn't lock. It, it's held together by magnets under underneath this little element here. Um, again, it's, it's really finicky and really hard to find where it seeds in. So I'm finding myself rotating it. I think it's in there, but it's the same idea as the, the magnets are not strong on this at all. So I'm finding it trying to get it back into place okay it's it's locked but with very minimal effort it just slides right off this has fallen off on us that wasn't intended but but you see it's i'm not i'm not flailing around i'm not messing around too terribly much but it's just it's exposed to the elements thank you rafa that's kind of the 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 overall on the build the quality what you're looking at so let's let's talk about what matters as if none of that bugs you cool this is an 11 mil ultra wide full frame lens that's pretty impressive when you put this thing on your camera you see the world edge to edge i mean it is it's it's pretty incredible to see what this sees you can literally see to the side of the lens uh, i think there's nine blades in here for the aperture uh, it is a t uh, 4.3 it's supposed to be a spherical ultra wide in my opinion it's a fisheye lens uh what's a fisheye lens it's a lens that makes everything look weird it has a certain look um, it does not zoom. This is a prime. So uh, you're stuck at an 11 mil. And then if you say, oh, that's, it's too wide. I want to image crop in or shoot at super 35, then just get a 16 to 35. Get uh, get a 14. Uh, you, you can see some of the images here uh, that, that we shot. Very quick tests of we did a shoot in Texas. And we were, we were inside, um, had plenty of light. But in this shot here, we have a shot of, a, of an eyeglass maker who's working in his in his uh, little shop. It's on a slider, so this lens is probably about three feet away from him, and his, and he is left a frame, and it's just heavily distorted. So in, in this shot here, you uh, there's a little bit on the on the element itself, a little bit of zhuzh, so you see see some specks, some dirt. But in this shot here, you see minimal flaring um, on this thing from the sun being right in it. I'm getting decent flares, nothing weird. I, I like that. Right here, you can see edge to edge things look right, but if you look at the scooter here on the far right, um, that, that boy is stretched. That's like a limo scooter. This is probably 10 to 15 feet away from where I'm shooting. And I mean, it, that, that side element is super stretched. But as we see this vehicle approach, you can see it right there. That's, that's in a good quarter of the canvas right now. Watch the car as it goes by. Yoink. Right there. I'm 25 feet away from this car. It goes from a limo to like a hat. This is weird. Uh, so you see this long stretched vehicle and you can see it literally squashing in on the element. And it's not really till it's like dead center that that's about how accurate. It may even be overcompensating in the center and squishing it back down. So it's very hard to tell what the true size of this vehicle is. From when we were shooting there, um, this is what it looked like to me. It was a, it was a much shorter, smaller, compact uh, SUV. And then as it approaches the light, it, it just stretches back out to be like a Porsche. We shot in New York City at Rockefeller with the tree. 
um, you can certainly see the buildings um, very far away, heavily distorted um, on, on the sides. Now, when, once it's kind of like locked in, it depends on the scenario. Right in the dead center of the lens, it seems to be pretty aspherical. It seems to be what, in my opinion, of what is accurate to what you're seeing in real life. I love shooting wide angle, not ultra wide angle. Um, I think there's a huge use case for 21 mil, for, for 24 mil, for even 18s sometimes. Um, I think you can do a lot of stuff, incredible things, narrative, documentary wise, it has a very specific use case. I knew that going in. I knew that I wouldn't shoot a lot with the 11 mil going in. Potentially some really tight spaces for a documentary that we're doing. Potentially some some different perspectives of how we want to see someone's world. Um, some of the other images that you see here, this is a little back alley of our of our studio. Now you can get into some more what I would consider like boutique shots with this lens. This is in an alley. You can see the distortion on the left-hand side with that pole. The trash can is elongated. I'm probably five feet away from our subject here. I'm gonna have him approach way, way close. And as, as he gets closer here, here's that incredible distortion that we see. So just from here, when he's straight up and down, leaning forward, you, he looks like an alien. Uh, this is to be expected, but I mean, you can get some pretty trippy shots here. If you want to look like you're inside someone's brain, there you go. Um, um, and then as you get into this ugly guy here, you can see, you can see some music video type shots that I, that I would consider. Here's me showing the distortion right here. As you just move slightly, uh, you can see that front hair. I have tall hair, but it looks even taller there. The forehead is stretched. The body is stretched right in there. Uh, the chin is stretched side of the face. Um, and then obviously like these kind of shots are cool. They, they can have a purpose. I wouldn't use them. I, again, probably more music video trippy stuff. You can get some cool shots. Um, overall consensus on the 11. Um, Unless you have 1200 bucks to spend specifically on 11 mil and you know it's limitations and maybe you shoot a ton of music videos, maybe you maybe you shoot a lot of architecture um, and you really need a, a cinema lens, um, then I guess it's for you. Um, I would not recommend this for vlogging. It's super heavy and there's about a thousand other competitors out there that make um, comparable lenses for a fraction of the price to invested this much in the build quality, I think it falls short in what matters most in the protection of your mount, the protection of your element just fell off again. Um, that, that's these two ends are the most important part to protect everything that goes inside. So, um, decent expected cinema build quality that falls short in my opinion for a very niche lens. If you can get your hands on it through borrowed lenses or lens rentals or someone like that, that has it and you want to test it out, test it out. Um, sorry, Irix, this really, really wasn't for me. Now let's chat about the macro 150. This is the Irix uh, 150. I'm going to show this to you this way. Uh, overall out, out, out the gate, same issues, the, the pull apart little PL mount. I'm going to breeze over this. It's the same problem with the lens hood. It's just a very, 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 <laughs> it's supposed to pinch and release. It's, it's the same design magnetic hood. This one stays on a little better, but I mean, little, little bumps. I'm, I'm pulling this apart very gently. I don't like that. If it's inside a matte box or you're even shooting with this element out front and, and you're just moving it around, carrying it from one location to another and it bumps your leg. It's coming off. Overall, the, the lens is very similar to the 11 in the build quality. I like, I, I do enjoy again, that it's just very, very smooth iris. It's threaded for your gears. Focus feels solid. Uh, I think it has a 75 degree rotation on this one. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty, pretty good uh, distance. It's a macro. So it's an 86 millimeter front, uh, 86 millimeter filter. Um, it's 95 millimeters on the front, so you should get it into pretty much uh, any standard matte box. Um, it's going to fit 
Uh, I will say this too. These are weather coated and sealed. Uh, impressive. That's cool. I'm giving that a check. Um, it has good build quality, really good witness marks on the sides for knowing where you're at exactly. Again, overall, it feels like a cinema lens. Uh, it, it feels solid. It has enough weight to it. Kind of makes you proud to have it in your hand. Like I got a cinema lens um, and that's super cool. Now, again, it's a macro with all macro lenses. Uh, it's a one-to-one. -one. Uh, it, it, it's going to have an incredibly sensitive field of view. If you're shooting this thing at a T3, I believe this is. Yep. Uh, T3 wide open. Your field of view is going to be minuscule. It's supposed to be that way because it is a macro, but in the reverse, most macro lenses, if you stop it down a uh, pretty, pretty fair amount, anywhere from like 16 to this one goes all the way down to 32 because an 11 blade aperture, <sighs> your focus should not still be that sensitive. Finding focus on this lens um, is infuriating. Uh, stop down to an F22 in broad daylight. It's so incredibly hard to find your focus, to ensure that you're focused, even with any sort of assist on a monitor for focus peaking. You know, we have a seven inch 4K monitor out with us in the field and I'm still second guessing and it's extremely sensitive. Even at an F22 or at an F32, finding focus or missing focus is a matter of about an eighth to a quarter of an inch. Not talking about here to here, I'm talking very, 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 very slight movement. I would like to assume that that is an issue with this specific lens. I would love nothing more than that to be the case. But in our experience with this, it was extremely hard for us to even get test footage because of how sensitive it is. There's a shot right here where we, we are shooting across the street. F this is across four lanes of traffic at a stoplight. There's a one-way sign furthest away from us. And there is an okay to cross kind of instructions of what happens with the, with the walk light closest to us on this side of the road. The difference between this, these two green poles, the one on the right, the one on the left that we're going to rack to is probably about 50 feet, 55 feet across. This is stopped down to an F22. Um, <laughs> You're always gonna get a, a fair amount of separation on 150 mil, especially in macro. That's what they're known for. But the difference of jumping 55 feet in focus was about an eighth of an inch difference, maybe a quarter of an inch difference. Um, Cause it's, it's that sensitive. I don't know what's up with that, but even this shot here of just racking back and forth between the one way sign and the instructions, sometimes I nail it, sometimes it's, it's missed completely because and it's not like i'm over cranking by an eighth of an inch or a quarter of an inch i'm talking it's fraction of an inch that allows you to be in focus or not in focus here's the positive i will say when when it's in focus when you're up very close to an object the i love the highlight roll off i love the detail the sharpness at at this level um, is impressive. This is just some dumb little nest that was on the ground and you can really have an appreciation for the fine little hairs in that bottom left corner over there. Um, that's nice, but being, being absolutely positive that you're on the focal plane that you want is a whole nother issue. And here, here's a good example of the, the focus roll off. Um, you can see how small of a focal plane that you have. That's to be expected in a macro. That's what it should look like. We're extremely close to the subjects, these little ants and these little rocks and dirt that's on the ground. Um, we were probably three feet away, maybe maybe two. Um, that's impressive for this lens. We have 150 mil macro that you can be that close. Even while it shows that they should be in focus, it, the, the focal plane is wrong. You can see me shifting there, trying to find them. So on a 4K image blown up like this, okay, cool. We have a couple of ants in focus right now but good luck finding it. It's it, you're going to have to basically set a focal plane and, and let the subject, whatever it is, if it's a, if it's a product, if it's a close up of a coin, you're going to have to kind of move that around and hope you get your shot. That's pretty standard for most macros. Um, the disappointing part in this is obviously the sensitivity of the focus wheel. I don't understand. Um, even stopped all the way down. We opened it up to a 16 through some ND in front of it. 
and it was following the exact same focus marks of of this uh, cone. There's a cone and a trash can in the back and you can see us kind of racking back and forth between that little safety cone and the background. Um, this is marked at an F22. So this is when we were at an F stop of F22. We marked the end of the orange cone, the and then the, the trash can in the background. We used a China marker on the follow focus and marked our, our start and stop. Um, and then when you put it, open up the aperture to an F16, um, it, it followed the same marks, um, but extremely sensitive again. Um, it's so easy to overshoot your mark. It's so easy to undershoot your mark. So there's, there's a sensitivity to the focus ring that I am, I'm not a fan of. I would, I would love to hear some feedback to see if there's anyone else that's experienced that. I don't know. Um, and, and the, the focus breathing, um, is terrible. It's to be expected at this price point for what this lens is, but it's, it's a deal breaker in my opinion, to see, to see that shift again, to fix that, you're gonna have to jump up into higher price range lenses. I, I get it, but it's still, it needs to be noted that the focus breathing on this thing is terrible. Um, the, the overall good build. It has everything that I would, I wanted to fall in love with this lens. I couldn't find it. I found myself more and more frustrated every time that I used it simply because of the, the insanely super sensitive, uh, focus. And the fact that I felt like I wasn't getting any type of change, whether I would open up super wide or close down to, to try to change my, my focal plane. Um, again, this is not to on IRIX. They make incredible photography glass, but I think these two initial launch out the gates are more of a niche category, um, that you're either going to love them or hate them. I don't like that in terms of review because I, I want to find something that's concise and, um, I can get behind. So unfortunately these fell very short for me and they're very boutique. Um, I am interested in the 45, but I am also apprehensive. So I don't know again with the 150. I don't know if it was, um, an issue that we got because it was, you know, it was pre-release or the, um, overall, if they're going to change up some of these designs, but so if, if you've used these, drop a comment, let me know, uh, if, if you like them, if you hate them, I could be wrong. This is my opinion. Um, but for everything that I was doing with it, it, it just fell short, felt underwhelming. I wanted to love them. I don't. Sorry, Irix, but if, if there's something that we've covered in this that you, you realize is a red flag or something that needs to be changed, or maybe we have a bad one, I don't really know. Um, let us know. We'll, we'll, we'll take another lens and see if we can put it through its paces. So that wraps up the review on the Irix Cine lenses. Um, we're going to try to create more and more videos like this. So if you have any ideas for things that you want us to review in the future, um, that's not so techy or so, you know, like into the weeds, user friendly, this is what we do. Um, let us know, Let's drop a comment in the thing that you drop comments in. I hate saying that's so YouTube-y. Follow us if you like, hit that bell button. You know what to do, you're on YouTube. It's not your first time. And if it is, hey, welcome, this is YouTube. Good luck, you're gonna see a lot of cat videos. Uh, that, that about does it. Check us out at liquidartsmedia.com, on Insta at liquidartsmedia, and uh, say hi, drop us a line. We'd love to see what you're working on. Till next time, peace.